Okay, well this is a telephone interview with uh, John Brenninger. Uh, John is putting on the San Antonio area guitar show this weekend, September 13th and 14th, 2014 in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, John, how are you? <laughs> I'm running around like a dad in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> well, I'm sure you are. Your big show uh, coming right up here on Saturday, right? Saturday and Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, I hope it's a big one. I don't know about that, but it's coming up one way or the other. <laughs> well, I, I understand. I was talking to your daughter, Terry, a little bit, and uh, I know Terry through my wife. And um, she's, I started a blog earlier in the year called Guitar Stories USA. And uh, first thing Terry said was, well, you should talk to my dad. I'm sure he's got a few guitar stories. Uh, and then I happened to be reading uh, uh, Vintage Guitar Magazine, and I saw your ad for your show. And yes, it, and we got a display ad that just came out in that magazine, and it's been running in the upcoming events for months. Yeah, well, I've noticed that. I'm a subscriber, and I know some of those guys... Uh, uh, Vic Dupre and Tom Guerrero and some of those guys who write for them. And, um, yeah, it's a great magazine. They just changed the format. It's a little smaller. They just sent me magazines to give away. They do every year at the show. Yeah. The latest issue. So we're going to be giving them away to the people that come in. John, I understand. Is this this is your sixth annual show? That's right. We started in, in 2009, and this will be the sixth annual San Antonio Area Vintage Guitar and Instrument Show. Now, is this mainly, uh, you got dealer, all these vintage dealers, or just anybody coming in? How many how many dealer types do you have coming in? Well, it depends. We only got 10 or so right now, 10, 15 maybe. But uh, you never know who will show up at the, at, the, at the door at the last minute. That's the way some of them do. I tell you, everybody waits to the last minute to to do everything it really puts a strain on me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot of it is the people walking in with their old guitar that grandma left them or somebody left them and they had it on the on the bed for the last 20 years and they want to sell it it's it's for buy sell and trade you know that's what we that's what we like for people to bring their stuff you know and there'll be stuff there to see to buy of course also yeah, and I've heard from a lot of my dealer friends that they actually go to these shows more to buy than to sell. Sure. A lot of the big dealers, uh, you know, people do a lot of trading. That's what they do. They try to pick up stuff and then resell it. I do the same thing myself. But I've been collecting instruments since probably 1965, about 50 years. That's when we started in our little bluegrass band. I was uh, reading a little bit about you, and a uh, real great article, I guess, somebody from University of Texas wrote uh, about five years ago. Yeah, um, I'm looking at that right now. I was going to refer you to that if you hadn't seen it. Yeah, I did see that, and I guess, uh, what you, was it your your ex-wife started out on gu uh, guitar, or you started out on guitar and then switched to mandolin? Is that what I understand? Yeah, that's what we did uh, in 1965, and my daughter, we bought her an upright bass big stand-up bass, and she was playing it just a few days later when we went to the fleet market and played. We had our bluegrass band out there, the banjo, mandolin, dobro. We had a real fine dobro player. He's dead now, but uh, he had a good collection of the old dobros from the 30s and before, and he passed away, and he was really, really a fine dobro player. He took a lot of the lead for the band, and when he died, well, I bought some of his ancient dobros from his widow. Uh -huh. I still have them. Now, what's your main interest uh, instrument? Uh, is, it, is it mandolin mainly? Do you play? Or? Well, I don't play very much at all but now, but just for fun, you know. But I play a little bit of guitar, a little bit of lap steel, a little bit of dobro. And, uh, you know, uh, when we had our band, I was the mandolin player. I still have my F4 1928 F4 Gibson Mandolin. Mm -hmm. I, nice. I owned a uh, Gibson Lloyd Lower F5 that was made on the same day that Bill Monroe's real famous mandolin was made. Oh, is that I wish right? I still had it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I wish I had it back. I've had a lot of the instruments that got away. Well, what what made you want to put on a guitar show anyway? I guess I had a little lapse in, in sanity. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, it's a lot of work for no pay. And it takes. I've been working on it for nearly a year. Every time it takes nearly a year, not every day, but, you know, continuous working. And it's a lot of fun, though. I mean, you know, it's, somebody's got to do it. You know, it's just like what you're doing. Somebody's got to do that. That's right. Keep it all, they, keep it going. If, if they didn't keep the old-time music going, it'd all die out, you know. So you got to have some stewards to take care of this stuff well that's right but i like to do it i i've got one of the best facilities in the state of texas the new Brownsville convention center is just absolutely beautiful this year it's going to be in the ballroom we've been having it in the exhibit hall but this year it's going to be in the ballroom so uh we'll see how it goes now, do you have uh, do you do you find you have mainly uh, dealers from Texas, or they come from come come from all over? Well, we encourage them to come from everywhere. I've had a few from from Oklahoma. Uh, one of my main vendors, he won't be there this year, but he's sending a display. Is from uh, Arizona. That's Antique Electronics, and they do a show out there. But they run a big electronics company that deals in in uh, reproduction and vintage uh, parts for guitars and amplifiers and all that kind of stuff. Well, and and, and what do you find uh, people or the dealers are coming up with? Are they is it is it elect, mainly electric guitars or acoustic guitars or just a little bit of everything? You never know. It'll be uh, what we like to see: some old guy come in with something that he's had for years, you know, or under the bed or something. And last year, I think there was a nice little Gibson amp came in that was made in the fifties. I think I bought it from the owner. And, uh, you know, we would like, there's been, there was a $35,000 guitar show, so there, uh, I don't know what it sold for, but that's what they were asking. Uh, maybe that was last year or year before last at the show. And, you know, that's, uh, like a, I think it was a 58 or 59 Stratocaster Fender. Oh, nice. Some of those guitars are very, very expensive. Oh, yes. They can go up, as you probably know, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's what I would like to see walk in the door, but <laughs> <laughs> there's not a lot of them around. <laughs> Well, there aren't. There aren't, and I was uh, I was at a, a show here in Orlando. Um, they have every January, and and sure enough, there was a '59 Les Paul Sunburst there, and one of the old bursts. They didn't want anything for it, did they? Oh no, no. A actually, it was kind of a deal. It was only about a hundred grand. Uh, well, that was cheap. Those things go for over two hundred thousand. Well, and I saw one recently, a, fi a '58, I think. Uh, somebody's asking four fifty. Four hundred fifty thousand for it. Yeah, that's true. The the ones that are the most valuable is the fifty eight, fifty nine, and sixty burst. Yeah, yeah. And those are my and the, those are my faves too. I'm a Les. I've got I've got a nice Strat and Tellys, and but I love my Les Pauls. You should have bought that that fifty nine. Well, you know the problem with it was I, I I've later found out that the reason I think it was so cheap is the the, the neck had been redone. But it had been redone by Gibson. It was a refitted neck. And maybe that's why it was a little cheaper, because it was beautiful. Oh, was it Les Paul or a Fender? Yeah, Les Paul. Mm -hmm. What yeah. year was it? It was a 59. Wow. That's, well, uh, you know, everybody, somebody, somebody uh, give up their ITs for one of them. You know, <laughs> a lot of people would. Well, you know, it reminds me of the uh, how Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top landed his uh, his '59 burst. Uh, speaking of Texas stories, you ever hear that story? How he how he got his hands on that thing? <laughs> yeah, it's probably it was published in Vintage Guitar Magazine. I, for, I, for, I forget where I read it years ago, and 
uh, I guess some old, just like you said, some old farmer had it and hardly played it, and and uh, he was he was looking for a burst, and one of his friends found it, and he had just gotten a check from his girlfriend who drove out to California with his car. He called Pearly Gates, and sold that car and sent him a check for I think three hundred and fifty bucks, <laughs> and the and the farmer said, "Well, how much you got?" And he said. This is all I got, 350 bucks. Of course, this was in, you know, their mid-60s. <laughs> and he said, well, I've tried to play this thing. I just can't play it. So you can have it. <laughs> wow. You know, that's, uh, that's the kind of stories you like to hear. You heard of the Flying V's, too, the early ones? Oh, yeah. There's been a few of them uh, around, and they belonged to some famous players, too. They had a big article in Ben's Guitar about them the early ones but they're worth probably more than these early Les Pauls you know like 58 to let's see 50, I think they came out in 58 58 and 59 mm -hmm. back there you know those things are just unheard of you know if you if you ever find one of these type of guitars you might you can just retire for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> that that's the the holy grail you know it, as they say it definitely is definitely is and i've had a lot of guitars that i wish i had back i had a very mint i mean absolutely mint and the case was mint too that i bought at a bargain if i still had it back as a gibson top tension flathead Oh, mm -hmm. very rare, 1937, mm. and I sold it real cheap, and now that banjo is worth seventy-five thousand dollars. Wow! And there, there are a lot of them that that are worth more than that. And I mean, original uh, flathead five-string, like Earl Scruggs played, and some of those guys, Snuffy Jenkins. Some of those guys, you know, those are, you, you can't even touch them. You know, you can't find one first place, but if you did, it's, <laughs> it's uh, untouchable, you might say. They're just, uh, you know, those things run in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there's people that got the money that they'll, they'll buy them and for an investment. The, all these instruments don't always go to players. They Some of them go to investors. That's what they're doing a lot now. A lot of the big investors are buying musical instruments as an investment. Yeah, and, and, and there's a lot of mixed emotion about that, too, you know, uh, by, the, sure there is. by the players. But, but, yeah, but, you know, uh, it's like they say, everybody's got an opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that's one thing I like about uh, Joe Bonamassa. He actually tours with those 59 and 60 Les Pauls. And, and uh, I think it was uh, Rumble Seat that sold him one on a payment plan. They said, the only, re only reason we're going to sell to you on a payment plan is if you promise to play it. Play it live. And he does. And I, I hate to see beautiful things like that sitting in some case by, by a collector myself. You know, I like to see guys out there really playing them. Well, there's, there's, there's that side of the, the aisle. And then there's the other side of the aisle, like people like Gruen and some of the big dealers. You know, they they want to buy stuff that's unplayed. That's or virtually unplayed because that's the ones that are worth the most money. After something's been beat all the hell for 20, 30 years, well, yeah, it's still rare and still valuable, but not like one mint that's been on the bed, you know? Yeah. So, you know, if, if somebody's looking for one, either as an investment or to play, they're looking for the cream of the crop, the ones that haven't been played very much. Well, that's true. That's true. So you, you expect some good vintage uh, guitars at your show? I don't expect anything real, real high dollar or real, real rare. I mean, you know, uh, San Antonio probably has some. We're, we're 20 miles from where we have the show in New Braunfels, mm -hmm. but you never know, you know, what to walk in there. And if I knew, well, I'd, uh, I'd take out a loan. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be ready for it. A huh? <laughs> couple of hundred thousand dollars if some rare is going to walk in there. But, you know, uh, there's no way of knowing. And most people that are 
that own something like that, they're real shaky about it. They don't want even anybody to know about it, and you can't blame them, really. Right. You know, but if, when they get ready to sell, I, well, I was waiting on you to call me. I got a call from Corpus Christi, a guy wanting to bring his guitars up here. And I've had several calls of people from around Texas, not in San Antonio, but around Texas that are bringing guitars, you know, to sell. Mm-hmm. And whether they do or not, who knows? But, yeah. Well, how, how how far is Austin? Austin's not too far, is it? Austin is, it says in that article you read, it's 80 miles, but it's actually 70 miles mm-hmm. from San Antonio. You read the, that article about me. Oh, yeah. It, it started out like that when we used to play with some people from Austin who was only 70, 80 miles from San Antonio. But Austin is a big mecca for music and instruments and everything. You know, I don't know why... Uh, there's some people, one of my big vendors is coming from Austin, Big Stone Guitars. He builds custom style guitars. The first ones he's been making, they're kind of <clears throat> Strat styles and Telecaster styles. Mm-hmm. But he's got a new one out that's going to be a Gibson type, not a Gibson, but a type, mm-hmm. uh, you know, set neck and all. So it's going to be displayed at the show, hopefully. Do any other dealers you want to mention? Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll mention the one here that's the biggest vintage dealer here is based on music. He's coming, but he likes to come over there to buy, like he was talking about. Yeah. I mean, he'll bring stuff to sell, too, but he's mainly looking to buy, like we all are. Sam Ash was there last year. I don't think they're coming this year, but... You know, when we first started, me and my ex wife we used to travel across the country, and we'd stop at every pawn shop and drove them crazy, and my kids crazy. <laughs> but I'd stop at every pawn shop. You could buy stuff back then in the 60s, late 50s, 60s, and even early 70s for dirt cheap that is worth a bunch of money now. Oh, and yeah. it was everywhere. You know, if I had any sense at all, and when... I started working at the post office in 58. Mm-hmm. I went down there and bought me a 58 Les Paul and a 58 Stratocaster and a 58 Telecaster <laughs> and just put them, put them somewhere, you know, in the box. <laughs> <laughs> and and maybe a Flying V. I might have, you know, the Flying V and the Explorer and all them, they weren't very popular when they came out to you. They couldn't hardly give them away. Right. But, you know, if they weren't selling for very much money, maybe $300 or so, brand new. Well, and even, but, the, even the Les Pauls, when they came out with the bursts in 58, they, they only made about, uh, what, 1,800 of those from 58 to 60, and and that's why they came up with the SG. Nobody was buying them and, until the British started buying them. Uh, a few years later, and Eric Clapton, people like that, started playing them. And, and, that's true, you know... Uh, if we could only go back, but it's the same thing today, very, this very day, if people were young enough and they had enough sense to go buy some of this stuff that's going to be collectible several years from now and just hang on to it, that's, that's, they wouldn't even have to worry in their later lives, they'd be set, <laughs> you know? That's true. And, I, and they can play it, you know, if they want to play it too. I'm not saying not to play it, but Buy something that you, it's hard to know what's going to be rare and valuable, but, you know, you got to, you got to look at the past, what's, what's been the trend. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we're not too far from Mexico. Yeah. 150 miles. And if I didn't think I'd get killed, I'd make a trip down there someday (laughs) because there's a lot of vintage stuff, uh, guitars, automobiles and everything in Mexico and of course Cuba and South America and everything, but it's that's out of the question now you get, <laughs> they wouldn't you know, you'd disappear if you went down there <laughs> <laughs> but we got a casino the only one in Texas is down at uh, Eagle Pass right on the border right on the river oh. and I'll make that trip down there sometime but I, I'm a little shaky about going down there by myself you know <laughs> and it's in Texas <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, you you got to be careful, especially when you got some cash and you're guitar shopping. Yeah. So I don't know how much longer I can <laughs> mess with this foolishness, but uh, it's it's really been a pleasure meeting you and talking to you. So, well, the pleasure's been mine, John. Nice talking to you, and and keep on doing it, man. Keep on putting on those shows. Well, I'm gonna try. There's a lot of people that are negative as hell. Yeah. And they say, why are you doing this, you nuts? And, you know, they do everything they can do to discourage you. But like I say, you know, it's not always about money. Right. And everything in life is not about money. So, you know, you got to do what you enjoy doing. Well, that's right, John. That's right. And and guys like us, we got to carry this on so younger guys can... Uh, clue in and 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 share that with us keep it keep it all I going i wish i was a great musician like some of these uh big musicians are but i'm not a i'm not but this is the thing that i like to do now there's a lot of bigger and finer guitar shows orlando dallas arlington the ones in california and all over the united states mm-hmm but I've got the best little guitar show in Texas <laughs> and the only one in South Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you got to keep doing it. <laughs> well, if I get a little encouragement, you know, uh, my daughter, Terry, has been the one that's encouraged me the most. And so that's all I need. <laughs> all those people that will be looking at your stuff, that if they want to come and get a booth, I'll make them a hell of a deal. If they want to come and just walk in with their stuff and sell it or trade it or whatever, I, you know, you can publish my my phone number if you want to, my email address, whatever. Okay. Well, yeah, great. And I've got all that info from your uh, Vintage Guitar Mag ad. And, but you uh, have to do it pretty quick. <laughs> yep, I know. It's coming right up. And uh, Thank you very much. Take care and have, have a good time. Good luck at the show. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.